I'm Marij Jongsma, I'm Associate Professor of Rabat University, and I'm working with the, at the Faculty of Social Science. Uh, I teach at the School of Psychology, but also our research master in cognitive neuroscience. And my research is mostly related to neuroimaging research. Yes, um, I don't know, this discipline, I've studied neuropsychology and I really like neuropsychology. It's trying to understand the relation between brain and behavior. So, how does the brain shape our behavior, but how can we also understand when there's something damaging the brain that certain cognitive behaviors, so uh, in our cognitive behaviors you have to think about attention, about memory, about concept formation, uh, but also planning. Uh, why we are experiences, experiencing difficulties with that? Now, by learning more about how the brain does all these very complex operations that we use in daily life, language, interacting with each other, we can get a better understanding about certain neuropsychological disorders as well. But we can also do fundamental neuroscience and study more about the brain and, and see how this, this, this extremely fascinating organ works and makes us do what we do. That's, that's a difficult question. I think there's also a lot of overlap. Mm -hmm. um, I think in the beginning, a lot of our students are always a little bit intimidated that they also have to learn a lot about the brain and about neuroscience and neuropsychology. Um, but I think it's, it's in all aspects also with clinical psychology that you cannot really uh, not take into account the importance of the neural substrate, the brain that's involved in these processes. The difference is that we focus mostly really about our cognitive capacities uh, and clinical psychology is very much involved with, with our emotions, I think, and uh, those aspects. Uh, psychiatry is really more related to the medical sciences as well. So how come, for example, uh, with very classic psychiatric disorders, how can we understand schizophrenia? which is more like a fully genetic developmental disorder with triggers and differences in neurotransmitter systems that also need medical treatment. Um, but there is a very strong link from neurology to neuropsychology to psychology. If somebody, for example, gets a, a CVA, so uh, for example an infarction in the brain or hemorrhage and gets paralyzed but maybe also gets a speech problem, they go to a neuropsychologist to see the nature of the speech problem, but also to get advice for the best treatment for rehabilitation. So we work closely together both with neurologists, but also psychiatrists and psychologists. Yes, I, I, I think there, there the overlap is even bigger. Mm -hmm. Um, I think the neuropsychology is a little bit more direct towards the clinical applications. The cognitive psychology is a little bit more focused towards research and also takes into account or has a starting point uh, um, the cogn cognitive function in, in typical developing people. Uh, we like to say healthy, but how do you define healthy? So I rather define it as typical and atypical. So even somebody with a brain damage can obviously be very healthy, mm -hmm. but might be not typical. And we now also talk about neurodiversity. And I think cognitive psychology is more covering the whole domain. Yeah. Uh, a clinical neuropsychologist will use a lot of test batteries. And this is to get a whole profile about all these different cognitive functions. So for example, attention, memory, planning, concept formation, language, motor behaviors, etc., intelligence, and see if there's any specific decreases in certain cognitive functions that uh, can tell us exactly where something might go wrong. Yeah, so that's for clinical assessment. Now, if we look more at the research part, we would like to understand more and, and see how we can um, study how all these functions 
work together and might actually modulate and influence each other. So for example, because this sounds all very abstract, if you do a memory test, yeah, and if you have to continue, for example, monitoring a road in a driver simulation, we can study the ability to multitask, but it can also learn us that it's very difficult to answer your phone if you're driving a car, and that the risk of getting actually into accidents yeah, gets much higher. Uh, in my own research, I, I normally use neuroimaging, and neuroimaging we do together with the neuropsychological experiments and testing, we directly look at reactions in the brain. Now we have different neuroimaging methods, so we have a whole center for neuroimaging, and we use the MRI scans, so I think most people nowadays know what an MRI scan looks, or fMRI. We also have the MEG, uh, but I use mostly the EEG, so the electroencephalogram. Make sure you're top of your undergraduate class. <laughs> no. I think, I think motivation, and, and I have a really clear interest about the brain and behavior. It's very helpful if you are uh, also well educated in high school in biology and mathematics. It's very biological and very closely related to the medical science. And that's also what we see. A lot of students that have been doubting between medicine or biology and psychology, they, we attract them for the neuropsychology. It's helpful to get a bachelor in, in uh, psychology and then to do a master program uh, directed towards either clinical neuropsychology or cognitive neuroscience, depending if you're really interested in research and an academic career, or if you're more focused on continuing with a clinical postgraduate uh, training. We see a clinical neuropsychologist, we see them not either working together with a neurologists, the department of neurology, but also in clinics for rehabilitation, like I said. Um, we also see them uh, working together with the part of psychiatry, because there's also a close link, uh, or for neurodevelopmental disorders, so with uh, dyslexia, ADHD, cerebral palsy. So I think most people know about dementia, and it's, it's, it's normally very much understood as problems with your memory. Um, and this is where the richness of neuropsychology actually comes into hand, uh, because it's more than just memory. If people age and, and their uh, brain also starts to you know, age and, and, and uh, loses its quality, all your tissues are aging, uh, the most striking thing that we see, and, and half the people over 80 will get some sort of dementia or problems with their memory function, but it can be certainly related that pretty much all your cognitive functions might decrease. So the speed of your information processing, but also your attention. Um, it might be difficult, for example, to, to follow a, a conversation with a large group because it takes you more time to process all the information or to stay attended. But very often it's always reported as a memory problem because if the information is not really processed, of course it's also not very well stored. Uh, but it's more than just memory problems. Now there are a lot of dementia syndromes, most knowingly is Alzheimer's disease, uh, but we also have vascular dementia and many other types. Now, neuropsychologists can really help in distinguishing what kind of memory disorder there is and also give some tips and tricks 
on how to uh, deal with it in daily life and which aspects of memory are most affected. For example, storing the information or retrieving the information, which is already a difference. But maybe even more important, in elderly people it's quite difficult to see the difference between, for example, depression and dementia. So if people have a depression, maybe because they lost their husband or wife, um, they might lose attention for the surroundings. And this might almost start to look like a memory problem because they're not really engaged or attending. And what they also report is their memory problems because they're older and people are afraid for dementia. Now this is one of the first things you do as a clinical neuropsychologist. If people come to you with memory problems and they're older, you always check for depression. Because it might be due to this kind of depressive symptoms. Well, in the, the brain, what I find amazing, is a very dynamic organ. What we call, we have neuroplasticity. You're not, you know, born and that you uh, mature and that's it. Uh, we constantly change our brain. If you walk away here and you remember we had this conversation, this is only possible because there have been some activities and changes in your brain already. This is how we, we, we literally store memories in our brain. In order to have this plasticity, so this constant changing of the brain going, we need to use it. Don't use it and lose it. Um, behavior or, or motor behavior, sports, is also a very important aspect of that. More than half of our brain is actually involved in moving around and, and, and you know, being active. Uh, so staying active is an important one. Using all your cognitive capacities and get yourself sometimes out of your comfort zone. Like visiting a university in another country. Like coming to Nijmegen and visit a sports center. I can definitely recommend that one.